Welcome everyone. Very glad you're all here. Now, this um, lecture is in a way special because um, it's not so much talking about statistical formulas or algorithms, but instead it's talking about possibilities of using big data to manage, govern, run, control societies. And perhaps you may not like everything that uh, I'm presenting over here. Um, but in, in that case, I think we should agree that you would raise your hand and you would make a comment or ask a question. I'm going to present some things that are being done with data and digital technology already. I'm going to present things that might be done in the future and some things that may never happen. And also perhaps they will never happen because we start thinking about it and talking about it and starting to say how we want to live and how we think societies should be run using data and digital technology. However, the purpose also is to show you that if you use these powerful methods of data-driven approaches the wrong way, a lot of damage could happen. And of course, that is to be avoided. I also want to raise your awareness that actually the world is faced with pretty serious challenges and it's not at all trivial how to solve those problems. Uh, different possibilities and perhaps none of them will work well. And the more we need to think about those problems and the options that we have and opportunities and what are the traps to be avoided. We know in particular all that the world is not sustainable as is our economy, we as humanity is overusing some of the resources of this planet. Um, I mean, more than the planet can renew, restore. Um, and that's why the United Nations have come up with the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of them, but they split up into sub targets and actually I think more than 150 altogether. And I think most people agree that we have to do something about nature and how we are living with nature. Things need to get better. Here is a typical visualization that you've probably seen many times that in some areas of the world, this overuse of resources or overconsumption, as some people call it, is particularly drastic. And um, what is the most important point is perhaps uh, how much resources is the world using all together. And apparently we're above one, which means that on the long run, this will most likely end in disaster if we don't quickly come up with new solutions. And so, that implies potentially ethical dilemmas. Those problems are so big that they are, at least for some people, about life and death. So these are really serious problems, not just theoretical problems. These are existential problems. And we are all sitting in one boat as humanity together. And that boat is called planet Earth. But it's not looking very good, actually. If you look at projections, for example, of the Club of Rome, of course, there are others also. And not everyone comes exactly to the same conclusion. But altogether, many of those future predictions of what would happen to planet Earth are not looking very good. In particular, what you see here is that at some point, <clears throat> services per capita would 
collapse or break down or deteriorate, however you want to call this. Um, and that, of course, is somehow related to our economy. And later on, also population is expected to go down quite significantly and death rates, the black line is, is expected to skyrocket. And why is that? It's basically because the resources on planet Earth are limited and so far uh, we haven't succeeded to harvest resources from other planets or from the universe, right? So we have a limited amount of resources and this is what we need to get along with. And one of those resources is obviously oil. Another one is gas. People are talking a lot about it recently because of the war in Ukraine. But I'm pretty sure one would have anyway talked about it more than in the past because there's a phenomenon that people call peak oil. First of all, a lot of people expect that by the end of this century, uh, a lot of the oil and gas reserves will have been consumed. So we'll run out of oil and gas. In other words, and problems, however, start not only when this is the case, but already when the overall production goes down, starts to go down. And that's the, this point in time is called peak oil. And there is no general agreement of when exactly this will happen. You can see again different curves representing the different predictions. And so, according to those different predictions, peak oil will happen at different points in time, but it would happen. Yes? Hasn't it happened already? I seem to remember reading that it happened in 2004, and that it's looking at efficiency of extraction, which going down each year. There have been, on the other hand, new types of extracting oil from the soil in the meantime. Um, those take more and more energy to get access to those resources, but I'm not 100% sure there's a general consensus on whether it has already happened, when it happened, or when it will happen. It's just overall, I think we can say is starting a few years back perhaps, and now in a few years in the future, we are in that window where basically we, we perhaps we should not call it a point in time, but a window in time where this transition somehow happens, right? And this has really serious implications for the greatest part of our economy because with the oil industry, a lot of other industries are connected, such as the car industry, the chemical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the agricultural industry, energy production, obviously, the, um, the financial industry as well. Uh, some people perhaps are not fully aware of that, but uh, we have or have had whatever um, money backed by oil, you know? So, you know, we have a mechanism of money generation, it's called fiat currency, but that currency has a value partly because it's backed by oil. And this is new money production, new oil needs to be produced and that will be consumed eventually and that produces CO2. So, one of those side effects of um, money generation seems to be that there would be eventually also not only oil production, but also production of CO2, and that will have an impact on climate. And that has become a problem so big that people are now talking about climate emergency. A global problem. So it seems like a new system is in need urgently. 
And so many people have thought perhaps um, digital technology is going to save us and we're already kind of <clears throat> really marching big steps into what people call the digital age and they say data is the new oil. And then what is the motor of this new digital age is basically artificial intelligence. I mean, these are, of course, only simple, right? Ways of thinking about this new time. And we'll figure out eventually what it really means. But what it means in particular, as more and more digital technology is being used is, unfortunately, so far at least energy consumption by digital technology has also increased pretty much exponentially it seems and uh, started off with about four percent to skyrocket towards more than 20 percent that's the expectation and could go well beyond so now machines are competing with humans not necessarily for not only for jobs but also for energy in a sense right unless we manage to use that technology in a way that teaches us how to use energy more efficiently and would really create a turnaround but thus far that hasn't happened but we can truly say we are now living in a time of big data within each minute an incredible amount of data is being collected i think none of us in the room can probably imagine that amount of data and there are many reasons to collect data so on the one hand to earn money data is a new oil to be more powerful knowledge is power for safety or security reasons, <clears throat> to improve sustainability and the state of the world, and also for health to save and improve lives. I mean, data can be used for all of this and many more things, no question. And then the question is what kinds of data are being collected? And of course, we know that a lot of data is being collected about us, but I'm not sure you were really aware of the extent to what this is happening. I'm trying to remind you. So it starts from online shopping, goes to real life shopping in a supermarket, goes towards moving around, Perhaps you have switched off the GPS sensor, it may still track you. Um, your social network, your files that you have stored in the cloud, <clears throat> the emails that you're sending and receiving are also being mined for keywords, of course, for better customer experience. Those book readers are set by some would actually be devices to read you. I mean, how you read books, what books you're interested in, how much time you spend, what, what are your, the subjects and topics that excite you. You know, it's a data collection device. It's not just an electronic book. And, of course, the search engine is also collecting a lot of data, a lot more data than it probably returns. Um, and then there are the digital assistants that also run on a lot of data. And while you watch YouTube or whatever video channel, also usage data is being collected. You may have a smart TV that also might collect data of your living room for example we don't have at the moment so many smart glasses but it could come anytime the technology is ready i guess for prime time your gaming console would collect data your 
electronic robotic uh, room cleaning devices. They could actually measure your rooms, you know, some of them use laser technology. Well, not only would they measure the room, they would also report back to companies that might want to sell you some furniture or whatever, you know, some insurance. Um, smoke detectors might contain cameras. Actually, you can even buy it online. At least it says currently unavailable. I think questions for how long. Then we have trackers. You know, if you think you can read any information on the internet without being noticed, it's very difficult to do that, uh, believe me. Um, there were the cookies, I collected a lot of data, super cookies. Now it's fingerprinting technology, as I think they call it. This is just part of the list, you know, of those trackers. In some cases, I've seen it for some online newspapers that could be 50 or perhaps even close to 100 different trackers that follow each single click that you make and uh, the news that you read. So, and you've probably not heard of most of those companies have collected data, you don't know what they're doing with it, and perhaps sell it to other companies. And then, of course, there are all these security <gasps> gaps in your computer system, the zero day exploits, but also some fundamental weaknesses of hardware solutions or software solutions and you have heard also about the Pegasus spy software, for example, that had been used basically also to target activists and politicians. Um, and uh, how freely can you decide if there is some system or somebody, you don't even know who, who collects all sorts of data about you. you know, just think of what your phone could know about you, including your emails, your photographs, your, the agenda, when you meet whom, and all of this kind of information, you know, how much meet potential of dual use is out there. And it's not just a smartphone that is collecting a lot of data, but smart cars as well. Now, before cars were doing what you told those cars to do, you know, or made the cars to do. Now these cars have, an, in a sense, an own life. They're collecting data about you, and most people don't even know what kind of data and what's being done with it. And you know, for some time, there's also been a discussion around the evaluation of what people say. It can be evaluated not only by microphones, there are also other sensors like accelerometers, gyroscopes, and so on, that can be used like the microphone and wouldn't show you when they're in action. And from the way you say things, you could reconstruct your mood, partially your personality, or whether you have drunken a glass of wine too much the day before, all of that can be evaluated and then reported to health insurance, to whatever and whomever. So this is what I already mentioned. So it's not always the microphone or other sensors that can be used. And we've read that the NSA is capable of finding your voice. They don't know where you are. You have a particular voice profile. It's like a fingerprint you can be uh, used to identify you even through somebody other's device. So even if you don't use a smartphone at all, you know, other people's smartphones could be used to find you, to figure out what you're saying, translate it in real time, search it for keywords, words, 
And um, I wouldn't be surprised if that would be happening really on a massive scale every day. So, um, and then the question is, would also the camera be used? I mean, at least for some time that has been considered. Of course, you can do interesting things and offer functionality like systems would figure out again your personality your mimics your emotions you would perhaps figure out you're just lying to somebody else because of the blink of your eyes you know whatever and basically your personality can be revealed by these kind of systems and you may not even have noticed And now that's not where it stops. Basically, uh, now there's technology that tries to monitor heartbeat from a distance or even EEG. I mean, brain activity, in other words. You may have heard about deals between companies about health and other data. So for some time, people didn't even know that their smartphones was collecting data that was used to infer about people's health. That was, I think, already before uh, the smart watches were actually sold. I think in the meantime, it's a lot more restrictive. At least you can choose whether your data would be shared or not. But for some time, I don't remember that possibility even existed. So also your house has been figured out to some extent. And um, oh, there's quite a few of those. And I would go um, to the extent that an IT company is considering to open its own hospitals, run in completely different ways, and could be a good thing, you know? We'll see, but it's a bit surprising, you know, that basically patient data have been collected about you and you were never talked or asked whether you agree with that. I'm not sure there's a guarantee that data was used for the insurance tariffs that we pay. Fingerprints can be collected to some extent at least. And then it's not perhaps very far-fetched to assume that sometime in the future, there would be also DNA sequencing on a massive scale. You know, um, we've recently seen that some high-level politicians declined to do um, COVID tests that Russia offered when visiting Moscow and uh, partly this is uh, because those probes can be used of course for DNA sequencing and knowledge about DNA on the other hand can now be used uh, to, to genetically engineer all sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> Then patient records have been given or sold to companies. In another case, it just has been stolen by hacking. And that has happened also in high tech countries such as USA and Singapore. So it seems to be pretty difficult really to have a hundred percent secure protection of your health data in other sensitive data. But anyway, so um, some people just think, oh, the benefits will be so big. Uh, it's better to have all this data and perhaps we could know everything and we could understand the human body, brain and personality and we could save the planet and, you know, job done. And um, of course, secret services are part of the game and um, sometimes they're even nice enough to inform us, such as uh, CIA Director Gassant saying us that we have already a sensor platform, 
and um, they can basically compute almost on all human generated information, which I think is a lot more information than you even guess. And <clears throat> how do they do that? Well, basically they're hacking all sorts of devices, you know, smartphones, smart TVs, uh, cars, <clears throat> perhaps even household appliances in the kitchen, uh, keyboard, internet of things and so on. You know, it's, um, wherever you can get data, they would be interested in getting this data. But then the question is how much data collection is good and where is it going to turn bad on us? And shouldn't we have some privacy to protect us also, you know? But it's kind of difficult in a time where we are wearing a bunch of sensors in the pocket. We are helping in a sense to collect all the data um, and in the end what comes out is digital doubles that have information about where you live where you work how much you earn who your friends are your family um, then what your health situation is um, what your personality is your psychology your strengths and weaknesses you know, basically everything. So there were even companies using this to advertise their services, see anyone's personality. You know, your friends, okay. <laughs> your family members, your colleagues, your neighbors, but also your enemies could look into this. And of course, a secret service even more so. But hey, why are they doing this? Um, and it's basically to come up with data-driven cybernetic societies, a new way of running societies. And the concept is pretty old, it goes back to Norbert Wiener. And it would be amazing to have a look at the works that he's written because um, a lot of what we now see has already been discussed uh, many years back. It was not ready for use at that time, but <clears throat> have a look at those books. And in fact, you know, already early on, um, the principle of cybernetic society is a verb being uh, used, for example, in Chile, it was an early application. And then Salvador Allende basically um, um, died or was even murdered and that political regime ended, but the technology lived on and was developed further. It was tested. Um, I would think probably in most, if not all countries around the world. And this is just one example of a country that has openly said that they are considering themselves as a social laboratory, you know? But then what does that mean for people? Um, would people be turned into digital laboratory rats? You know, it's kind of, uh, highly controversial and uh, even the Swiss data protection officer said that shouldn't happen. But uh, has it happened perhaps already? And it has uh, perhaps happened in many places. I mean, one common technique is A-B testing. <clears throat> and basically, they're comparing two designs of a web page, say with a big headline, with a small headline, with a red headline, with a green headline, with a flashing headline, with a non flashing one, text uh, on the left upper corner or right lower corner, picture here or there, man or woman. Um, all of this can be varied and um, people would respond in different ways and they would try to make that information most effective in many cases to 
make you buy a certain product or perhaps to change your opinion and uh, to vote for a certain political party also. Um, and that can be personalized. I mean, the A-B testing is being done millions of times every day. I would tell a lot about you, you know. Just imagine what they could figure out about you just from the content that you're looking at. I've been used for neuromarketing in particular. This is the personalized information that's being used for marketing. That personalized information that knows your wishes, dreams, and but also your weak spots and how you can be tricked. Tristan Harris has told us some of how it works. He's been working in a Google control room, as they call it, apparently. And he said in a tech talk, a handful of tech companies controls billions of minds every day. And there is um, another movie uh, called The Social Dilemma that has been also giving some details about that technology. Um, and basically they're producing really something like a digital twin with which they can experiment and figure out how you would probably respond if you were exposed to this information and that information and how that can be used to make you do certain kind of things. And uh, this is actually a picture that was uh, published about the NSA program and they built this control room, you know, like in a, a science fiction uh, saga. But that's basically the military thinking, you know, let's get all the data together in one place such that we can take the best decisions that, you know, Let's assume they don't want to do anything evil. Perhaps they want to save the planet and perhaps they want to figure out what would be the best solution for this planet. But then everyone has to do exactly what is part of that plan. And that basically means that nobody would have any freedom. Everyone should do um, what that plan foresees. And then, how would you get there? I would use digital information pretty much to control human behavior. In different ways, we'll see that later on. <coughs> Some people even speak of <coughs> weaponized propaganda AI that knows you better than you know yourself and could also manipulate you better than your friends and family. And this has basically been implemented digitally. So there are all sorts of tricks to manipulate people's thinking, emotions, and behavior. And that can be triggered digitally in many cases. And this is, being, uh, this is using cognitive biases. I mean, the brain is a wonderful organ that uses only 100 watts to do amazing things, not more energy than a light bulb, but you know, much more interesting functionality. Uh, but you know, that efficiency comes with simplifications and shortcuts, and that can be used to hack the brain, you know, to trick it. <clears throat> And yes, um, the NSA is probably not the only institution that is collecting a lot of information about as many people as possible and to basically be able to predict the future and to exploit that in some way or another. So there's not a lot of information on the internet about it, but some information, and that is quite interesting to read. And quite concerning if it would be used uh, in the context of wars and massive 
and these uh, massive uh, psychological operations that perhaps would involve millions of people. Yeah. All right, at least now you have a little bit of an overview of what kind of data has been collected, what can be done with it, and now we're going to start to talk about systems. If you don't have any questions or comments, so I don't see any names. So now shall I just go on? So system number one is often called surveillance capitalism. And you know this famous quote of a previous uh, Google CEO, I think it was Eric Schmidt. <clears throat> we know where you are. We know where you've been. We can more or less know what you're thinking about. It was many years back. Um, you see a date, uh, 2010. <clears throat> and so we are certainly on the safe side to assume that we are all being profiled and uh, a lot of details about our personality are being revealed. And I just want to ask, you know, who, who thinks that's fine? And who thinks that's fine? Please raise your hand. Without your agreement, nobody thinks that's fine. <coughs> then why are they doing it? <clears throat> and that information, however, is not just sitting in the database, but is being used to, to personalize information to manipulate choices, right? And there are many ways to do that, and I'm certainly not complete in what I'm going to say. So a lot of what we are now doing is uh, performed online. It starts perhaps from hotel bookings, flight bookings, and you know, perhaps ends with some dating app. Who knows? And um, all of that platforms are collecting services, but also are giving recommendations. So showing you some information, but not all information, just be too much. And so you're getting a very selective view of the world, of what are the options, what are the products, what are the services available. And that in itself is incomplete picture can already be used to manipulate you, but also to discriminate you or to favor you. But you know, just imagine everything that we're deciding is largely guided by information systems today. Who is in control? Is it you? Is it a big tech company? Is it the government, a mixture? And who is responsible for the outcome? I just have a look at a typical news web page. So there's a title, there's a teaser, there's an eye catcher, and there may be an advertisement, and there's a text. So we definitely know that the advertisements are personalized, but I you know some news outlets also personalize title, uh, why not the teaser, the eye catcher, do they show a man or woman, you know, what kind of man or woman um, could be all personalized to basically make you more interested in that context and context and why not personalize also that news story, add information, subtract information, replace words by other similar words. All of that is not difficult to do. But if it's all about profit maximization, you know, then these things will happen. And in many places they are happening. And of course we know, know about the personalization of advertisements. 
But then sometimes um, it can become quite problematic, for example, in a democratic election where you should have a fair competition of candidates. And one of the ways how people could be influenced in their choices would be the autocomplete function. I can see over here that uh, obviously is a very different complete being made by the search engine. And actually, it turns out uh, this is a research paper that people who've been confronted with such kind of keywords would even 50 minutes later um, still be influenced by those keywords. So it's still around. You may have forgotten in the meantime that you've seen that keyword, but it still influences your choices and your thinking. Now, surveillance capitalism is one of those systems. Um, there are other systems that are based on citizen scores. And those systems are existent around the world. And um, also in Germany, for example, there's uh, this Schufa citizen score. I think it's a citizen score, uh, which basically is being used to judge the credit worthiness of a person, but it's also being used to uh, I believe for many other things. And only very recently have they given some insights about how it works. But in principle, a lot of it boils down to a yes no decision. You know, you want to have a credit, a loan, you want to have an insurance. Um, and then the system would recommend yes or no. Uh, there may be a lot of data behind, but in the end, it's a number, one number that may decide about your fate. And that might be quite a bit under complex in a sense, you know, given that humans are really complex, beautiful beings, but certainly not to be captured in one number. Right? Still, it's being done, being done in business. Um, another index is the customer lifetime value, you know, how much money you could make on somebody. Um, and then in some countries, they're experimenting with putting different indices together in a super score, but then again, it's not one number. Um, and those citizen scores are being used uh, also in Western countries and uh, democracies. And of course, uh, many people are very critical about that and uh, think this is inappropriate. And in fact, there are some um, legal sentences by courts now that um, are turning down a lot of this. Um, I think also the German parliament, for example, has recently decided that scoring is considered to be a dangerous technology. For all the many applications of AI, this is one of those dangerous applications that I think. And also in this context, uh, some people have warned of the rise of totalitarianism or totalitarian technology among them, actually, Martin Schulz. Um, he was actually um, the president of the European Parliament at that time, I believe. And um, there was also an article in uh, a big newspaper translated why we need to fight now against technological totalitarianism. And uh, nevertheless, these kind of approaches have been applied in several countries. Um, for example, there was a triage algorithm that was developed uh, to decide uh, 
how much resources and time would be invested into unemployed people. Uh, some people get a lot of attention, others basically would be given up upon. And some people who perhaps are lucky to get what's left over. And um, shortly later, actually, similar technologies <clears throat> or algorithms, in a sense, were also applied to, to take life and death decisions during the corona pandemic. So now we're at the point where we see this technology can be there because it can decide about life and death. The reason might be shortage of resources, but still, you know, how comfortable do you feel about that? Who thinks would want an algorithm to decide about your life and death? No, nobody. That's what I expect. <clears throat> then there is an approach that's called Cody's law. Uh, actually, I want to say those approaches are not mutually exclusive. We have also mixes of those different approaches, right? You need to be aware of that. Cody's law basically means that increasingly algorithms are deciding what is possible still and what is not like laws of nature created by social engineers. You may not know by name, they have not been elected. You don't know whether they are qualified or to what extent, what their background in ethics is and all these kinds of things, what your political agenda is. Anyway, so <clears throat> people do create software that decides about <clears throat> what is happening and it is of course also being used in the law system or legal um, applications legal tech and particular speeding parking violations okay people would say perhaps that makes sense um, illegal downloads uploads um, some people get to already more nervous um, and all kinds of viol violations of laws and regulations and sounds like a good idea, but in an over-regulated country that might cause problems, right? Or perhaps this law applies, perhaps that one. And then classically, you had a lawyer to decide that. But now the algorithm would just say, okay, that's it. And perhaps the algorithm wouldn't mind whether you agree or anybody else agrees or not. So, so these kind of technologies have been used in all sorts of algorithms and applications. Um, Pre-crime is one of the key verses, even a movie about it. And so, this is about predictive policing, the attempt basically to identify criminals even before they commit the crime and to basically avoid and prevent the crime. Idea sounds great, perhaps, but then there is a huge error rate, particularly when it comes to terrorists, which fortunately are rare. Um, there are a lot of people who are basically getting on a suspect list because they don't want to overlook any terrorists. So the algorithms are being created in a way that is extremely sensitive, actually overly sensitive, and there would be many false positives and that also of course, has uh, pretty serious uh, implications. Some people would be discriminated against, and there uh, have been a lot of complaints about it, that uh, some kinds of people would just be treated like suspects more or less all the time. 
and that doesn't improve their trust in the state, of course. Even recently, MIT Technology Review has had this article, predictive policing algorithms are racist, and therefore they should be dismantled. But it doesn't stop there. Basically, there is even a karma police program that doesn't only look at possible murders and burglaries and uh, you know, car thefts and whatever, um, but they would really come up with a score of what is your value from the point of view of society. And somebody would define that. And they would use mass surveillance data in order to figure out what is your value. You have uh, listened to the wrong kind of music and they even look into music and what kind of movies you watch on the internet that would increase or decrease your score. And so this is not just about crime. It's, it's, we're getting towards soft crimes here, you know? Of course, many people were critical about it. The European court has judged that as um, crossing the lines of being legal. And um, so, um, now they're trying to look for new ways of hunting criminals in a sense without having um, this mass surveillance where they're collecting all sorts of data about everyone. But you know, who, who knows how this will end because this discussion has been around for a long time. People have been very concerned about bias because in the beginning, the idea was that algorithms would not be emotional and subjective and therefore they would be objective and fair. But it turns out, no, they're not, unfortunately. There's a lot of bias, bias against uh, people of color, uh, bias against um, various genders, um, in particular, bias against women, and none of those biases are acceptable. And there's also all sorts of issues with face recognition. And yeah, you can read all sorts of papers about that. Recently, there is more awareness about those issues that, uh, you know, AI is not only helping us to save problems is also, unfortunately, sometimes creating new problems as uh, unwanted side effects in many cases. Uh, we need to get more aware of those side effects in order to produce better software and systems. And for this, transparency can be instrumental. The next thing is kind of um, more with a question mark because um, it, in most places it's not there. So because money could be created in huge amounts in the past, the implication was that money was losing value over time. We call that inflation. There's a lot of talking about inflation recently obviously, and therefore basically as an attempt to come up with better systems, cryptocurrencies have been invented and there are many of them as you know, and not all of them are stable coins and backed up with, for example, gold. Also, Facebook was uh, trying to come up with a new, currency and it was called Libra in the beginning and later on DM and then they stopped the project altogether and sold the technology to another company. But still the discussion about cashless society is around and 
And the question is, what would be, be the implications? Is this going to be more a good thing or more a bad thing? And perhaps it's, it's not so easy to decide. One of those issues that are off, you know, you always think, okay, cashless, it makes payment so much easier, you know. Um, but also, there are kind of technological details that some people don't pay so much attention to that they can be quite tricky and perhaps controversial or even dangerous. One of them is how to define your digital ID. You know, in, in a sense, a company or a government wants to know, <laughs> is it really you who wants to buy this product? Is, are they getting the money? Is, is, are you entitled to buy this product? Are you above 18 if you want to buy you know, I don't know, cigarettes? Or do you have to be 16? I'm not sure. Um, so there may be age limits. So they need to know in some context uh, who you are, or at least some of your personal features. And that's what the digital ID is for, in a sense, a password, you know, that you get, give access to your bank account and unlock the payment. But how to make it safe, you know? I mean, computers are being hacked. Um, so people have been thinking about fingerprints, face recognition, other kind of biometry and um, thinking goes even so far perhaps to use nanotechnology. And um, I think there's still no final conclusion of what would be the best solution that is not only secure, but also would treat humans like humans. It's becoming possible then, of course, to block certain transactions. And there might be a political interest in that, because um, if we now have overconsumption and you know, want to save the planet, we may need, most likely, I mean, surely, we need to consume less. And if people are not doing that by themselves, then perhaps an uh, algorithm would be used to decide who would still be allowed to purchase that good or service and, and who not. Like you've already had a flight this year, perhaps a second flight you know, would not be admitted by the algorithm, who knows. Same thing about eating meat or whatever. Perhaps you want to rent a car, but haven't paid the bill for your apartment yet. No, it could be blocking the transaction. So basically it would not be that difficult then to implement consumption control, but how, how acceptable is that? And how bad would it be, you know, how much would people be forced to restrict? Even if you don't go that far, and there's another point that's also not being discussed, you know, is it being, um, the data being transmitted through the internet or uh, are they going to use satellite communication, which seems to be the next big thing. Uh, but then who again is in control? You know, and is there a control of the controllers? Um, how would it work? I, I haven't heard much discussion about these kind of things. Um, would feel more comfortable to have these kind of discussions. Um, but even if there's no consumption control, um, things could still be problematic because everyone could be offered personalized sets of uh, goods and services. Perhaps you would not be shown that five-star hotel 
for the price of a three star hotel that your friend or colleague will be offered. But perhaps you won't see it at all, maybe. And perhaps um, the price will be very different because now it's possible to make personalized offers. That means what used to be a market with an almost infinite number of participants and accelerating a bit, but you know, we have had the situation where basically supply and demand was matched and that uh, generated the equilibrium price. But you couldn't be treated in a discriminatory way. You know, all basically got that product for the same price, say. That, that system is being replaced by a system where you have to negotiate with a huge company, a multi billion dollar company. Uh, basically sets the rules. I mean, what is your negotiation power apart from not buying it, but then what's the benefit you know, if you want to have this product or a service? So they could sell the same product at very different prices. And it could be that they're going to make you the best deal but perhaps not, perhaps they know how much money you still have on your bank account, how much money you can spend. They're trying to get most of that money as much as they think they can get from you. So basically the economy has totally changed. It still looks a little bit like the old economy, but markets have been replaced by personalized offers. And then there's, um, again, another development that is interesting. And uh, this is basically leading potentially from neuroscience to neurotechnology uh, to neurocapitalism, uh, basically the next stage of capitalism after surveillance capitalism. You know? And um, we start with the science. So, for example, there was a brain initiative, and it uh, seeks to deepen the understanding of the inner workings of the human mind and to improve how we treat, prevent, and cure disorders of the brain. That's the stated goal. And um, some of that technology that they wanted to use or develop was nanotechnology for neuroscience and um, the vision was also to come up with brain activity mapping. And here's one of the science papers. Um, nanoscience success and nanotechnology are poised to provide a rich toolkit of novel methods to explore brain function by enabling simultaneous measurement and manipulation of activity of thousands or even millions of neurons we and others refer to this goal as the brain activity mapping project. And so the projections are in terms of how much storage space would be needed for all the data that is coming up. So a couple of years back already, this article could be read. There's a projection of future developments and said knowledge doubles every 12 months at that time and every year, which basically means in one year, humanity was producing as much data as in all the years of human history before. And that's going to be 12 hours. In 12 hours, they're going to produce as much data as in all the human history before. You know, it's just, uh, an amazing amount of data. So that will consume several billion petabytes. Is it working? Well, who knows? Um, and that is something that would uh, be very much interesting to learn more about, I believe. And there's uh, also a paper about human brain cloud interface. 
And um, then here is another paper which talks about neurocapitalism, in particular the dangers, right? So because not only would potentially at some point in time it uh, be possible to read your mind to some extent and your emotions, but also to where you can read, you can typically also write. And that, of course, opens up to totally new avenues for politics. You know, here they call it pico economics um, for public policy. But the concern is there are also some people working in the ETH domain on that. A brain reading tech is coming and the law is not ready to protect us. And for that reason, some people demand that we should have neural rights in the constitution. And um, that is something, however, that has, it seems to me, not yet been worked out in full. And we are in a perhaps particularly vulnerable point of human history. Certainly, with nanotechnology, you could uh, collect even more data, you could create highly detailed digital twins. And that may not be a bad thing, uh, but the question is who owns your digital twin? And at the moment, it's obviously not you. I mean, at least you, you don't have access to the data. <laughs> Even if you were the owner, you know, you don't know how to get access to the data and how to use it. So um, many people, I believe, would agree that we need to find a solution for that. And some people think perhaps the Web 3.0 is uh, the new framework for such a solution, basically to make a leap from data monarchy, as they call it in that article, to data democracy. Uh, but what I personally think is important is that we would have platforms for informational self-determination. Because the data can be used to manipulate our thinking and behavior, and we are not in control, and somebody else is in control, and we might do things that we would be held responsible for, but perhaps we're not responsible for what people are doing. So, you know, this is really entering totally new areas where, yeah, uncharted territories, I guess, would uh, be a reasonable description. Personally, however, I'd like to. Um, argue for another approach also using data and digital technology but in the sense of digital assistance of coordination self-organization and co-evolution so you may know that i am a complexity scientist and i'm very much interested in systems that are made up of many components or people uh, interacting with each other in a nonlinear way. And this often creates self organization. Self organization could have good or bad outcomes, but what the outcome you get depends on the interactions. So, by changing the interactions or by assisting those interactions in suitable ways, you would get a favorable outcome by self organization. You know, coming about automatically by itself. And here's basically um, a movie I like a lot. Why is it not running? And you see, it's a highly diverse uh, traffic environment, but uh, there are no traffic lights, and people rarely have to stop. 
Rather, all the traffic flow is self-organized. Um, and this works because there is a particular design that supports that self-organization. We do have a unidirectional flow in front, the opposite unidirectional flow in the back. And in the middle, there is some little buffer that allows people to adjust their speed in such a way that they would find a gap in the traffic flow when they want to cross it. Works quite nicely. And actually, this has, in a sense, inspired our self organized traffic light control that we've developed, where not a traffic control center imposes a seemingly uh, superior traffic light control scheme on, on the city, but where the um, traffic flow is controlled with traffic lights. So like in the cybernetic thinking, it's again information feedback that is essential for this. But here in a distributed way, not in a centralized way. The Internet of Things could be used to collect data locally to enable that feedback. <clears throat> and here are some papers that you might read uh, for the details. And we are again working on this kind of approach. And even in those modern times of machine learning and AI, it's really working in a totally mind blowing way in a sense, because um, it is using traffic physics to anticipate waiting times and uh, derive uh, proper green times. And even though it's less predictable when the traffic light is green or how long, the travel times through the city become more predictable and shorter. And all of that is, of course, better for the environment. Also, one of the inspiring works that is behind this is the traffic flow that bottlenecks. That tends to be oscillatory <clears throat> and looks a bit as if there would be a traffic light over here for police controlling the flow, but none of that is the case. It's rather a pressure principle that leads to the turning of the flow. And so the idea was that an intersection is also a bottleneck in a sense, just for more different traffic flows. And we could find or define a pressure principle that would create oscillatory flows at that intersection. And we could do that in a way that would produce an efficient service of vehicles. Moreover, we could do it in a way that would create the coordinated traffic between neighboring <clears throat> intersections. And if we do that well, the coordination would spread eventually. There would not necessarily be a centralized control. The question is no, would such a principle exist? Would it work? Or is it just a dream? And therefore, we basically make computer simulations. And we compare three different approaches. Uh, one is the centralized control, traffic control center that tries to collect as much data as possible about the city and the traffic flows. And that uh, would then try to optimize traffic line control and then impose the optimal control on the entire city like a benevolent dictator. Sounds like a plan that could work. The issue is just traffic flow control is an NP hard problem. There's so many possible parameter combinations that you cannot do that in real time. And therefore the optimization actually makes simplifications 
and thereby it throws away potentially some very good solutions. In particular, many of the traffic light controls focus on repetitive periodic services and then try to synchronize the cycles. And then, of course, today you're more adaptive and flexible, but you're not going to come up with a, a new order of uh, traffic light services in every single cycle. So you make some adaptations, but you don't reinvent the world every second or minute. This approach is very different. Um, no traffic control center. Every intersection is trying to strictly minimize the travel time of those vehicles and the neighboring um, road sections. So even analytical formulas. So it's like homo economicus would do it. Everyone does the best job possible locally. However, this intersection, that intersection don't talk to each other, right? They don't even care. Everyone just does what is best locally. And so we would think, okay, probably this is going to lack coordination and that's going to be better. And here in the third case, we do the same thing, but sometimes we inter interrupt the minimization of travel time to clear a long queue of cars to avoid spillover effects be friendly to the neighboring intersection if you want i would think okay that friendliness would not pay off for that intersection you know it producing delays so that would be the worst solution one would think and let's see what really happens the red curve represents what happens with the traffic control center top down regulation. You know, as the capacity of utilization goes up of the intersection, the queue length of cars also grows. Okay, makes sense, right? However, then if you look at this selfish optimization locally, according to the homo economicus approach, then it turns out. We're doing much better, much shorter queue lengths. Why? Because we're not waiting for the cycle to be completed. If a car approaches the intersection, we give it a green light right away. But then eventually, the more cars arrive, you know, eventually this thing gets out of control and the queue lengths explodes. And the traffic control center is happy and says, hey, that's why we are here. You know? And that's why you're paying millions of a year for that traffic control center to coordinate when things get heavy. Now, interestingly enough, uh, we, we can say Adam Smith's invisible hand works over here, but over there, it's invisible hand basically means self initiation, right? Interestingly enough, the third approach, the other regarding optimization and self regulation, this works better all the way. Because if things work better in the neighboring intersection because I'm friendly to it, and that neighboring intersection is also friendly to me, I also have a benefit. So we can make the invisible hand work. Coordination would come about driven by the traffic flows and it would save a lot of time for all the different modes of transport so as you can see over here we didn't leave it with the computer simulation we also eventually got interested in real life scenario in particular in Dresden and my previous PhD student Stefan Lemmer has actually been involved in implementation projects. And now he's working also at Swiss projects. One of them was in uh, the city of Lucerne. 
I can see quite clearly how much improvement could be reached by this flexible, adaptive self-regulation approach uh, that we had developed some time back and it's now in practical operation. Also, has been very carefully evaluated. I think even for a year, they have been measuring what was going on according to the previous control, which certainly was a state of the art traffic control as you can get it on the market. And uh, then they measured when the new control was implemented, the self-regulation approach, and it was evaluated by an institute of ETH. I didn't even know about it, so I'm not sure how secret that was, but that independent evaluation came to a very positive conclusion. Not only the newspapers that reported that the super traffic light uh, would produce more green for everyone. Sounds like an impossibility, but just makes better use of green time. Doesn't waste green time when nobody is there. And instead, it gives green time to, uh, to those who need it. So a flexible adjustment to local situations is the issue. And that means um, centralized control has limits in particular. If you have a complex system with heterogeneous elements, large degree of fluctuations, short-term predictability, then those self organization approaches can actually outperform a centralized control approach. But due to the increasing connectivity of the world, a lot of systems become more and more like this. So, you know, the, the self organization approach may become ever more important for well-performing systems. And, and this is also how we think uh, democracy could be actually upgraded digitally by boosting collective intelligence. And of course, you've often seen those uh, bird swarms. Planes would do that at the airport, it would probably not feel so comfortable, but birds can do that. Right? And that principle, in fact, can also be applied to social systems. We then talk about the wisdom of crowds or collective intelligence, and it has been studied in many works how that collective intelligence can be promoted. And uh, one of the important um, preconditions is actually diversity. And um, independent information search, and then information integration, where you try to bring together the best ideas of many minds and come up with innovative combined solutions. I personally believe that um, cultural pluralism can actually help us to come up with better solutions by combining different solutions. So we should work together. But it turns out that um, the process uh, would go on in three phases. Phase one is about independent exploration of information, information gathering. Um, here, you should have a diverse approach and manipulation should be avoided. In the second phase, it would be information exchange. And then there would be a deliberation process and an integration process of different solutions. And perhaps in the fourth phase, there could be a voting if that is still needed. But the interesting point is that diversity wins are not the best. Like if you have smart people come up with uh, their best solutions and then rank those solutions and then combine 
the best solution with the second best and the third best, which you would think would reduce the performance of that best solution, you would often be surprised to find that this would increase the performance of the solution. And that applies to many um, solutions of complex problems, but we have many of them in the world today. And you know, so this is really hard to say. There's no right or wrong solution. You would, classically, you would have said that's the best and that's the right solution. And all the others forget about that. But now we know that this apparently best solution can be improved by not as well performing solution. Coming back again to the traffic control, you know, we have combined two approaches. One was the travel time minimization, which created this explosion of the um, queue lengths at a reasonably high capacity utilization. And then we had a stabilization approach there serving long queues that is also not working very well as compared to the centralized control but combining those two solutions that have serious flaws you know combining the two approaches is actually coming up with a better solution quite interesting so and we've also been working on approaches to incentivize choices that would perform better than yes, no majority decision or even market decisions by incentivizing a broader exploration of a solution. That means by encouraging a more diverse search of the solution space. Now, coming back to cybernetic feedback approaches. We have not shown it away altogether, but uh, what we've done is we've been working on a new approach that would be multidimensional and would be locally adaptive. And the goal is what we call participatory sustainability. I mean, you, using everyone's participation to improve the system, such that we get from those wasteful supply chains of today towards a circular economy. Because it turns out that today in industrialized countries, everyone is wasting about 50 tons of materials. And these materials are just thrown away at the moment, but in principle, you know, cars, computers, smartphones, furniture could be reused, recycled, whatever. And that needs to change, obviously. And perhaps the Internet of Things could offer us new possibilities to manage the use of resources, could cheaply measure um, through a network approach externalities of choices, activities, and production of companies so-called externalities, like noise, CO2, poisons of all kinds, waste of, of all kinds, all that could be, these are externalities that can be measured. And then basically the principle would be to increase positive externalities, to reduce negative ones, and to ensure a fair compensation. And this would introduce new forces into our economic system. I mean, I'm not, calling for a lot of regulation here. I'm just suggesting to introduce new forces that would support the self organization of the system towards a circular and sharing economy in a co-evolutionary process. And it's not in one step, but you know, if everyone improves in response to everyone else's improvement, then your system would eventually get there. And I believe much faster than if you would try to enforce it by regulation. And for this, we need to have multiple feedbacks. 
a multidimensional uh, approach actually makes quite a big difference. This is a typical supply network of today. This is the supply network part of it of our body. Um, looks quite different, the metabolic system. And so here you have feedback loops and things. And um, I think we could probably learn a lot from how our body works, how nature works, how ecosystems work. And we should try to learn from this how the symbiotic systems are working. And you know, there's so, so many different goals. We certainly cannot reach them all by one quantity, such as a particular kind of money. But instead, we would need to have uh, multiple feedback loops that would incentivize multiple different things. And this is how I think we would eventually get towards a more symbiotic systems. And so I'm concluding by saying network effects make all the difference. Um, and we are now obviously experiencing a transition towards more network systems. Network effects can promote combinatorial innovation for the economy if we're open enough, so it's such a different solutions can be combined with each other. They can promote collective intelligence to the benefit of our society, and they can um, promote multidimensional real-time feedback for the benefit of nature and a more sustainable system. That's it on my side. So of course, I'm very much open to any comments or questions at the moment. This, what I was trying to do today is to give you a perspective, you know, what data is being used today or could be used today or tomorrow or in the future. And that is really very important to reflect on how we are making use of these very powerful opportunities that are out there to avoid mistakes dual uses, unwanted side effects, and come up with the best solutions ever. And, you know, I think there's nobody in the world who has that perfect solution for the world. It needs to, the combination of many people's smartness and great ideas to find our ways into this future out of the difficult existential threats that we're in today and I'm very much confident that people like you um, will make a substantial contribution to this. We can make it. All right, that's it. Thank you.